an inverse function is. So we're really going to be focusing on inverse functions. When we start out with any function, say f of x is equal to 3x minus 1, then I typically, with our regular functions, is I put in some value. So let's evaluate, say, 7, right? So I put 7 into this function. I get 3 multiplied by 7 minus 1, and so I get 21 minus 1, so I get 20. Typically, we are putting values in and evaluating, so we're going in that direction. Let's put something in and evaluate. What happens if I tell you that f of x is equal to 16? So if I say f of x is equal to 16, then what this is saying is it says I have y, and I want the x that produced that. So it's like, okay, I have the answer. What produced that x? Well, what I could do is I could just say, okay, let's set 3x minus 1 is equal to 16 and solve, right? And that's going to give me the x that produced that. So then when I see f of x equals 16, that says I have the answer. This is the same thing as saying y equals f of x, which is equal to 16. So y equals 16. So I can just set my equation equal to my answer, which is 16, and solve. So I get 3x is equal to 17. Divide both sides by 3. x is equal to 17 over 3. So if I put 17 over 3 into my original function, I should get 16 out. So let's check. So f of 17 over 3 into my original function. So 3, 17 over 3 minus 1. My 3's will cancel. <coughs> And I get 17 minus 1, which is 16. So if I put in 17 over 3, I get 16 out. Questions so far? Now the whole reason that we learn functions in the first place is it allows us to say this rule is going to hold true for any value I put in to the, from the domain. So I don't have to do a whole bunch of different kind of things. It allows me to say I can do all kinds of calculations as long as I'm choosing x from my domain, these are my out output, these are my answers. So inverse functions says I'm going to find a rule that I don't have to do this each time. I don't want to do that each time. I don't want to set each of my answers to the equation and try to figure it out. So what I do is I say let's find the inverse function. Let's find the inverse function. So when I do the inverse function, f prime of, or f raised to the negative 1 of x, this notation is inverse. And when I see that notation, it means I have the answer, y, and I want the x. associated to that y value. So we do write the inverse function by taking the function we have and solving for x. So let's go back to our equation. We have f of x is equal to 3x minus 1. If I'm trying to find the inverse, the first thing I do is replace, oh actually, before I even do that, I need to assure it's one-to-one. -one. So that's a notation for one-to-one. -one. So I need to assure my original function is one-to-one. -one. So let me explain what one-to-one -one means. So I'm just going to go over here and explain what one-to-one -one means. And I'll write it as one slash one one-to-one -one functions. First of all, they have to be functions. And second of all is that for every x
there can be only one Y associated to it. which is the whole function part of it. And for every y, there can be only one x value associated to it. So what that means, what that translates into, is that we have to pass a horizontal line test. So we know that it has to be a function. That means it has to pass the vertical line test. That's how we define our functions but now it has to pass a horizontal line test. So as an example, if I'm given a function that looks like this, it's clearly a function, but it fails the horizontal line test because it hits it twice. So that means unless I restrict my domain, it is not one-to-one. -one. So you can't have an, an inverse of a quadratic function? Without cutting at the vertex, which is what we're gonna talk about. So we can get an inverse of the quadratic, but to, we have to, and this is important because we're going to go to pre-calc 2, is we have to cut it at the vertex on the, for the domain so that it will pass. So initially, unless you cut the restrict the domain, no, quadratics will not have, will not be one-to-one. -one. That means we won't have inverses. So we have to ensure it's one-to-one. -one. So let's come back over here. <clears throat> to assure it's one-to-one, -one, it has to pass the horizontal or vertical line test. So to ensure it's one-to-one, -one, I replace f of x with y. So y equals 3x minus 1. And I try to solve for x, right? So if I try to solve for x, I know that just looking by inspection, by just looking at it, I'm not going to have two y's associated to one x, right? I'll just solve for x. It's not going to have two y's associated to that one x. So I know it's not gonna, I know it's gonna be one to one. The next thing I'm gonna do is replace f of x with y. The third thing I'm gonna do is solve for x. Now if you watch other videos, and I have other videos up there, it just says, oh, switch x and y at that point, solve for y. No, I like to solve for x. The reason I like to solve for x is because it gives us fluid to solve for other variables. So I come back over here and I get y is equal to 3x minus 1. I'm going to add 1 to both sides. I'm going to divide by 3. And I have solved for x. The last step is replace x with f inverse of x notation and replace x with y, or y with x. Replace y with x. So I come over here, and this part here is going to be replaced with f inverse of x. And then I replace this y with x. So f inverse of x is equal to x plus 1 divided by 3. How's it going, Olivia? Sorry. Tired? I have a lot on my mind. Okay. No excuses. I mean, no, no, you can have as many excuses as you want. What I meant is um, you don't have to apologize. No apologies. Oh. You're fine. You're totally fine. Everyone's face is out, especially toward the end of the quarter, including myself. I'll have that look like, uh, start drooling out the side of my mouth, trying to figure out what the heck you were asking me, because my mind is somewhere else, too. So you're totally fine. No apologies necessary. Okay. So 
what I now have is I have an inverse function. This moment right here, when I replaced x with f inverse of x and I replace y with x, this is the moment in which the domain of my original function becomes the range of my inverse function. The range of my original function becomes the domain of my inverse function. It is at that moment that happens. <clears throat> so if I see this notation here, this notation tells me I have an answer or range value. I want the input or domain value that produced that in the original function. Okay, so I have the answer or the range value and I want to know what input produced that answer in the original function. Whenever I see that notation, that's what it means. I'll give you a now if you remember what we had was, I told you before, I said f of x was equal to 16, what produced that? Well, what I did before is I set that equal to my original function and I solved. But once I have my inverse function, I can put 16 into my inverse function and find the answer. So this always should be given an f of x equal to Yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. So further, if I said, well, what if f of x is equal to negative 5? Well, I could, option A is I set the original function equal to that. Option B, as I go to my inverse, which is f inverse of negative 5, is equal to negative 5 plus 1 divided by 3. So what I must have put in was negative 4 thirds. So the original ordered pairs for my original function here would have been 17 thirds went in, 16 went out. And my original function here, negative 5 went in, negative 4 thirds, or excuse me, negative 4 thirds went in, and negative 5 came out. So that's what the original function is. Now, when you are talking about my inverse functions, then inverse, the ordered pairs, I keep hitting that with, my, with the palm of my hand, the ordered pairs for the inverse function are the the switch of them, 16 went into my inverse function, 17 thirds came out. On my inverse function, negative 5 went into my function, and negative 4 thirds came out. So this is that moment in which you'll notice my domain became my range, my range became my domain. My domain became my range, and my range became my domain when we do inverses. Now the last step on this is to confirm we really truly had an inverse. So to confirm that we really truly have an inverse, this is the last step, is we have to check f of f inverse of x equals just x, and f inverse of f of x equals just x. So that's my last step.
So now we're going to confirm that I truly do have the inverse. So I have to compose it both ways. This is why we have to le learn composition of functions first. So let's do the composition both ways. My original function is f of x is equal to 3x minus 1. What I believe my inverse to be is f inverse, actually I'll do it in a different color, I'll do it in blue. So it'll be easier to see. f inverse of x is what I think it is, is x plus 1 divided by 3. So I'm going to do f of f inverse of x. So in other words, I'm doing f of x plus 1 divided by 3 into my original function. So in my original function, wherever I see x, I replace it with that. So 3 multiplied by x plus 1 divided by 3 minus 1. I can see that my 3's will cancel, leaving me x plus 1 minus 1, so it gives me x. So it checked that way. Now I have to check the other way. So f of, f inverse of, f of x is equal to f inverse of 3x minus 1, which is equal to wherever I see x in my inverse. I'm going to replace it with 3x minus 1. So I have... 3x minus 1 plus 1 divided by 3. So this is going to equal 3x minus 1 plus 1 divided by 3. 3x over 3, which gives me x, and that checked that way as well. So these are not difficult to do, but there is a lot of algebra. A lot of algebra. So what I'd like you to do is I'm going to give you a new one to do. I want you to find the inverse. Okay? So here's the example I want you to try is f of x is equal to 7x plus 5. Please find f inverse of x and then check it both ways. And this is linear, so I know it's one-to-one. -one. So we should check to see it's one-to-one, -one, but I already told you it's linear, so it is one-to-one. -one. So I replace f of x with y, so y equals 7x plus 5. And then my next step is to solve for x, so I subtract 5 from both sides. Divide by 7, so y minus 5 over 7 is equal to x. My next step is I replace f of x with f inverse of x, and I replace y with x. So I end up with x minus 5 over 7 is equal to f inverse of x. Or I can write f inverse of x first, so I can rewrite this as f inverse of x is equal to x minus 5 divided by 7. Now remember, at this point, when I go from here to here is when my domains and ranges switch. It is at this moment where the domain of my original function becomes the range of my inverse. The range of my original function becomes the domain of my inverse. It is at that moment that holds true. So now all we have to do is compose both ways to make sure that I truly have an inverse. So I have to check f of f inverse of x is equal to x and f inverse of f of x is equal to x. I have to check these both ways. So f of f inverse of x is equal to f of x minus 5 divided by 7, which is equal to, um, my original function was 7x plus 5, so 7, x minus 5 over 7 plus 5. 
my sevens cancel, leaving me x minus 5 plus 5. x is equal to just x, because that's plus 0, so it equals x. So that one checks out. So now I have to check the other way, f inverse of f of x, which is equal to f inverse of 7x plus 5, which is equal to 7x, I'm going to put a plus there, 7x um, plus 5 minus 5 divided by 7, 7x over 7, this equals x. So it does check both ways. So that's how we find inverses. When we, that's how we check it. Domains become ranges, ranges become domains. And the reason we have to do this is because where we are going is we're going into exponential functions. Our look ahead into chapter uh, 6 is some value raised to the x. So we're going into exponential functions. Notice that the base, they call this the base, the base is greater than 0 and not 1. Because if it's 1, 1 to any power is 1 all day long, so that's not interesting. So unlike in the past, what we've had in the past is we had g of x is equal to so x raised to a constant. Now the constant is the base. And the exponent is where we see the x. And so we're going to start, so this is a polynomial. But this is an expo uh, ex, uh, this is a exponential. And the reason we have to know exponentials is because we need to, and inverses, is that our other function that we are going to learn is our logarithmic functions, which are inverses of our exponentials. So those are the things that we have left to learn besides linear stuff, which is super easy. And they're super important. The exponentials and logs are super important for calculus. Super important for calculus. So that's where we are. That's where we're going. Two weeks from today, it's all over but the final. Yeah. But the ordered pairs for in